What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you my review for Divine Divinity, the first of the Divinity series, which eventually spawned Divinity Original Sin 2. And while that's a great game in its own right, there's a ton more to the Divinity universe, and most of that starts with the first title, of course, Divine Divinity which is not actually the first title out of Larian Studios. There was one published before it known as LED Wars, which was a more strategy-focused game, real-time strategy, really, which received some praise and I believe was their actual first published title, though they were working on that along with this project at roughly the same time. But Divine Divinity was originally released in 2002, and while the combat is very much so a Diablo-like, it also has a lot of more traditional RPG elements as well as a fairly open world to explore, in addition to a non-linear story, which makes it a very remarkable game in a lot of ways, and as far as classics go, it's one of my favorites. But first, let's talk a little bit of history about the title in terms of its development. Larian Studios was founded in 1996, and one of their first projects was called Unless the Treachery of Death. However, this was later turned into the title The Lady, the Mage, and the Knight. However, this particular game never actually saw the light of day. It was a collaborative project between Larian, another studio called Attic Software, I think, which was being published by Infograms. Ultimately, this collaboration proved troublesome, and the game was eventually cancelled in 1999. However, this is relevant to Divine Divinity because they took what they had learned and developed there in terms of the engine, and turned that into Divine Divinity. However, it must be said, the game was not actually supposed to be called Divine Divinity, or Div Div for short, you'll sometimes hear people call it. And while I agree that's a relatively silly name, that was actually forced upon them by their publisher for the title, which was CDV Software. The actual name for the game was supposed to be Divinity Sword of Lies, which is honestly a much more fitting title. And in many ways, Divine Divinity is a mashup of a lot of other popular games at the time. Diablo, of course, but also things from, say, Baldur's Gate, like their reputation system, and those kinds of things made it into the title. But at the same time, Divine Divinity does a lot of unique things that make the world feel like its own. For instance, the teleporter stones, all the lore around the seven races, and their seven gods, and much of the world building that we see in Original Sin 2 got its start here. As a result, it's a game that brought together a bunch of elements from other games and managed to produce something relatively unique. And because of this, upon release, Divine Divinity did pretty well. Unfortunately, Larian Studios didn't really see any money from it, as most of it was taken up by its publisher, which is noteworthy because Larian Studios cites this, as well as a few other problems, as to why they largely went the self-publishing route, because working with publishers just never really worked out for them, whereas crowdfunding and self-publishing has obviously exploded their popularity. But from there, let's talk a little bit about the story setup, though I'm going to be fairly brief with this, because because I've already done a story series for this game. I'll link it down below if I remember, but if you want the full story, I actually covered that in like an hour-long video where I go over everything about it. But to keep it pretty simple, our chosen character wakes up in the city of Alaroth after we were saved by some healers who found us collapsed in the woods after a fight with some orcs. Once we wake up, we are introduced to a few characters who explain that the town's elder has been driven mad, and our first task is solving this problem, which involves clearing a dungeon below the city, which serves as a sort of extended tutorial about how the game plays. Though it's mostly self-guided, the game's not really showing you much, but rather providing you an opportunity to learn on your own. Once this is done and you're able to leave Alaroth, the game quickly draws you into a much grander plot surrounding people chosen by the gods, as well as an attempted summoning of the demon god Chaos. But to put that in a little bit of simpler terms for people used to the newer versions of Divinity, the story that Divine Divinity actually tells is how Lucian the Divine became the Divine. The canonical character you play in this game is actually Lucian, and the canonical character you pick is the male warrior, which we'll talk more about in just a moment. But again, if you want more details, check out my story video. But my broad thoughts about this are, for the most part, I like the story. As someone who's very into divinity lore, it's got a lot going on, and I enjoy playing through it for that reason. I also enjoy that the story is very non-linear. There are, of course, a couple breakpoints and a few structured areas to sort of guide you down the right path, but much of the story can be tackled in your own way. There's often multiple ways to do something, and 
you don't have to necessarily do all of it in the same order every time. There is a lot of non-linearity here. But with that in mind, the entire game is relatively clunky, and this is largely due to the aging systems and modern hardware. But in terms of the story, the non-linearity of it can lead to some moments that don't line up quite correctly, or can even leave you unsure about what to do next, that kind of thing. Combined with some of the game-breaking bugs that are present to this day, can make actually completing this game these days a relatively challenging thing to do. Which brings me to my next point for this review, and that is the more technical-minded issues. So for starters, it's an old game, all the way back from 2002, and in some ways, the game doesn't like modern hardware. It is very much so playable, but as I mentioned, game-breaking bugs definitely crop up all the time, and there aren't really a lot of settings to adjust in-game, which means you can certainly be in for a bit of frustration. Now, when you first fire the game up, it will present you with a small launcher that will let you set the resolution, that kind of thing, and at most, I would play this at 1080, as things like the UI do not really scale, and thus higher resolutions, you're going to give yourself a very difficult time in terms of reading and actually seeing what you're looking at. And beyond that, it's not uncommon for main quests to break, NPCs to not spawn, things to not trigger correctly, that kind of stuff, which means you're likely going to want to be familiar with what is known as a hex editor if you plan to finish the game. A hex editor is a program that will allow you to alter the binary of a given file, and thanks to some handy guides actually published by Larian Studios on their very old forums, they will explain exactly what to change to fix various issues, but I would imagine most people aren't going to be comfortable doing this, and given the game's likelihood to break on you, it's just not a game I would expect to finish if you decide to try it out these days, so certainly something to keep in mind. From there though, let's talk difficulty and character classes. So the class you pick at the beginning of the game is relatively important, but not be all end all, as every class will have access to every skill. What this does change, however, is what your special attack is. Each class, the survivor, the warrior, and the mage gets a special attack, or a special move, if you will. Survivors get to sneak as they are essentially a rogue, warriors get a whirlwind attack, and this is important. Now, canonically, the male warrior is the correct way to go, but ironically, it's also the one that is the most broken due to a small bug with invisibility. You see there are invisibility potions in game, that of course turn you invisible, and actions are supposed to break this. However, the warrior's whirlwind attack does not break invisibility for whatever reason, which makes it a very cheap way to kill anything in the game, provided you can get the invisibility potions. Furthermore, each one of these classes has a couple of skills that will level up as you level up without you having to manually level them up with your skill points. And for the most part, these just lean into what you would expect the class to do. Warrior gets some passive damage, that kind of thing. And this is also where we will pick the game's difficulty, which isn't particularly noteworthy, it's more or less what you'd expect. Health and damage of enemies, the beginning of the game will be harder or easier, but by the end you're going to be an overpowered monstrosity, so it's not going to make much of a difference, especially when you start talking about some of the combat bugs we're going to talk about here in a bit. But moving on from there though, let's talk progression systems. So progression comes down to attributes and skills. As you kill things, you'll level up, each level up providing attribute points and skills. Attribute points raise your attributes, and they do exactly what you'd expect. This is a very Diablo system, but attributes, most notably, are required to equip certain equipment, which is going to dictate your playstyle a little bit. And then we have skills. Skills are grouped into three sets of four trees, the way of the survivor, way of the warrior, and way of the mage. Each class can access all of these, which allows you to mix and match pretty freely, and each skill can be upgraded multiple times. Again, very Diablo system. The real problem here is that not all of these skills were created equal, and some of them are almost comically overpowered. For instance, a level 1 version of Polymorph can reliably polymorph most bosses, which becomes permanent due to a bug when it's supposed to be temporary. A lot of the magic skills are very broken, as you would expect, and a lot of the survivor skills has a lot of your non-combat oriented things, like lockpicking, trading, etc. So there's a little bit of non-combat focused role-playing there. But one thing to keep in mind here 
is that while attributes can be augmented via equipment and you're going to get enough points that it really doesn't matter that much, you're likely to be able to max out three to four of the attributes. The skills, on the other hand, it is very important what you put those into, largely because you cannot change it afterwards. There is no ability to reset your skills unless you specifically use something like a hex editor to fix it. Beyond that, though, it's a very permanent decision there. And given that there are a variety of skills that are not useful or good, you might want to check out a guide or two before you try making a build. Now from there, let's talk about the gameplay and the world a little bit. So first thing to know is that this game uses a sight range and fog of war system, which you've likely seen on screen up to this point. Your character has a sight range, which is the lighter area around your character and will also be up to the point that you clear the fog of war, which is hiding the map. Once the fog of war is cleared, you can still only see to your sight range. It is possible to move the camera around a little bit, by the way, using, I believe it's cam lock by default, which will let you move the camera independently of your character a little bit, which is important here and there due to some weirdness in certain settlements about being able to see a character to talk to them. And while this is fine enough for the more open areas, I do find it frustrating in settlements that you have this big fog of war because it can make you just kind of run around aimlessly just clearing the fog of war so you kind of get an idea what you're looking at. And especially as one part of the map is just a big city, it just seems silly to have to go in and clear all of that. Beyond that though, as I mentioned, the game is largely open world. You have to clear Alaroth first and then you're pretty much free to explore as you please, though some places are locked off a little bit by the story. There are a couple of loading screens as well, so I wouldn't consider it a fully open world, but it's very close to it. And you'll be able to go around, find settlements, engage in branching dialogue, which can set you on various quests, some of which have alternatives as far as how you complete them. And in that way, for a game in 2002, it's pretty remarkable. That said, though, the game is relatively static in terms of its world. So while it is an open world, it's not going to like change dynamically to what you're doing. And clearing out enemies and just the map in general is going to stay that way. Things don't really respawn, which is certainly something to keep in mind. Though in terms of running around and talking to people, something you might want to keep in mind is your reputation. As completing various deeds, etc. will add to your reputation, which will affect how people talk to you, much in the way that, say, Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 did. So needless to say, there's a lot to see and explore in a very non-linear fashion, which can be a lot of fun, though you'll definitely want to remember to save often, as this game does not autosave. There are only manual saves, so save often and with different save slots. Now, most of the game you'll be able to freely explore and move around, though the last act of the game you are confined to a sort of end game area, which is still pretty big, but the last part of the the game is much more linear than the rest of it. Now, as a sort of last mention for this part of the review here, what I really enjoy about the gameplay in the world at large is that most of the hallmarks of what makes Divinity Divinity is already here. Much of the game revolves around the seven races as well as their respective gods fighting against the forces of chaos. And while some of this was altered a little bit, for instance, what we know as Godwoken from Original Sin 2 are referred to as marked ones here in divine divinity, that type of thing. A lot of the cooler stuff is in place. For instance, the teleporter stones or the teleporter pyramids. These are in-game. You get them relatively early and they kind of work as your fast travel system. And even back then, you can absolutely use these to break a few sequences. Though it is worth mentioning that by and large, Larian didn't really start caring about the specifics of divinity lore until the original Sin titles. That's when they started trying to clean it up, so to speak, and make it more cohesive. So you will find inconsistencies, things that aren't elaborated upon. But if you're into the divinity lore, I definitely think there's a lot of really cool stuff to explore here, especially since, if you are unaware, divine divinity canonically only takes place about 25 years or so before divinity original Sin 2. On top of it just being a really interesting first look at some of the series' more prominent characters, such as Arhu or Zandalore. And towards the end, we even get an early look at series antagonist, Damien. But to sum it all up, there's a lot of really cool stuff to discover if you're a fan of the lore and just in general, but with it being an older aging title, the static nature of the world, as well as some of its implementation, can lead to it feeling very clunky, and at some times just outright breaking on you. But from there, let's actually talk about combat a little bit. Now, as I mentioned a couple of times, combat is largely speaking Diablo-like, but not as good, quite frankly, though it does have a sort of real-time with pause element to it as well. So for starters, in terms of the skills available to you, they simply aren't made equal. There's also multiple bugs you can take advantage of, such as the whirlwind 
thing that I mentioned earlier, or being able to abuse the polymorph, in my opinion, turns the combat into largely feeling like basically one of two builds, either a warrior or a mage-oriented character, as the rogue, while they have some cool stuff, ultimately winds up in a lot of melee combat that they need to overcome as well, as stealth and alternative approaches don't exactly fit well into a Diablo-like system, which makes their sort of more non-combat focused abilities seem a little underwhelming at times, outside of something like lockpick, which is universally useful. Which is further frustrated by the fact that, as I mentioned, you cannot respec, which means it's possible to build yourself into a corner and have no way of fixing that outside of just restarting, which is made even more frustrating by the fact that, again, these skills simply are not made equal. And outside of just looking up a guide or sheer experimentation, it's very possible to have a poor time while you try to figure all that out. So while it can seem like there's a good variety at first, I do kind of feel like you wind up playing a lot of the very same type of characters due to a skill and combat system that frankly isn't as robust as it appears at first glance. That said though, there's still a decent amount of fun to be had here, especially when you get your access to divine powers towards the end of the game. So while it might seem like I'm being pretty negative on the combat, for the most part, I would just say it's okay. I don't think anyone's going to really play this title and look back on it specifically for that reason, as opposed to the options and non-linear aspects of the title, as well as the world building. Because while the combat is okay, I think it's definitely the weakest part of the title. Now this is normally where I would talk Steam Deck compatibility, but but truth be told, this isn't a game that works real well on Steam Deck. I honestly couldn't get it running at all. The official rating is it is unsupported. And even if I were able to get it run just from my experiences with this game, I sincerely doubt it would be a good experience. Though, as I mentioned, again, I couldn't even get it to run properly. And its Steam Deck rating is unsupported. And unlike a lot of other cult classic titles, this game doesn't exactly have a lot of widespread love behind it in terms of, say, a dedicated modding team that's keeping it up to date, that kind of thing. And as a result, while I would never say anything is impossible in this regard, I just wouldn't expect to play this on the Steam Deck, nor do I think it would be a good experience if you could. But that brings us to our positives, negatives, and then we will wrap this thing up. So on the positive side of things, I think this game was pretty incredible for the time. It was hack and slash Diablo, but also open world had all these nonlinear options and approaches to the story, a variety of ways you could approach basically everything in terms of the quests. The world itself is also a big positive. What they built here went on to build up one of my favorite franchises, which is the Divinity series, as I'm very fond of the lore here. And seeing its first iteration is a lot of fun if that's something you enjoy. The non-linear aspects are also really cool to see, and being able to approach a story and complete it in different sections at a time from a game this old is pretty remarkable. Combine that with tons of side content and things to see, and do, and you've got a game with a surprising amount of content. Now, on the negative side of things, there are quite a few game-breaking bugs. Again, if you're not familiar with a hex editor, this just isn't a game I would expect to finish. It's also aging quite a bit, which makes it challenging to run on modern hardware. And without a more active modding community for this classic title, a lot of those problems will simply exist the way they are, as there's not really a lot of workarounds, which together can lead to a lot of frustration, which is really my biggest complaint about this title today. In fact, I believe I included this one in a list about games I would love to see be remade or remastered, because it could certainly use it. Which brings me to my conclusion. On one hand, I think Divine Divinity is an incredibly ambitious title for its time, and it did so many things really, really well. But unfortunately, it's not a game that has aged particularly well, especially in terms of the stability of that software. And while I think the game is worth playing and checking out, especially since you can regularly find it for like 50 cents to a dollar, it is very, very cheap most of the time. But even then, if you decide to play it, I just genuinely would not expect to finish it unless you are absolutely dedicated to doing so. Like say, for instance, you run a channel that used to cover Divinity Lore, almost exclusively. But in spite of all the issues that I mentioned and how it hasn't aged particularly well, I still think people should check it out. I think there's a lot here to love, even if it does have a lot of pain points today. But that is pretty much going to do it for this review of Divine Divinity. I certainly hope you enjoyed it. It's certainly a game and a world that means a lot to me and this channel. So it was a lot of fun to go back and actually review this one because while I have covered a bunch of the Divinity games, I've only reviewed a couple at this point. So if you made it this far into the video, truly, thank you so much for indulging me on this one, as it was a lot of fun. 
Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. But regardless, truly, thank you. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.